book in it or manuscript or map in it or drawing and it was open on a page showing Moses alongside the Ark of the Covenant coming down the mountain going up going down the mountain it's quite unusual wow but unfortunately there's too much glare on so when I took the picture uh, on my old 35 mil camera in those days we never had the old digital the new digital cameras like we've got today where you can look at a picture and see if it didn't come out you take another one so um uh, i had to use the flash and during that time you know the monk had left us alone and when he returned to the room and he served us tea uh, and then as we went out the guide who was taking us back in our two trucks to back to israel uh, he said, I want to show you something, which I don't normally show the tourists, but um, he knew, I was interested in all this antiquity stuff. He says, a few miles away from the uh, monastery, we stopped, and he said, I'm going to show you a carving. And I says, what carving? He said, well, it's, it's about 50 foot long, and it, it's a carving cut out of a mountainside of a calf. Hmm. And the the calf was actually mentioned in the the Old Testament in Exodus because when uh, Moses came down from the mountain with right. the tablets of stone, he saw the Israelites because uh, they didn't think it was going to come down. They thought that, that God had left them there in the middle of the desert, so they thought they're going to go back to worshiping worshiping animals, and they worshipped a golden calf. Right, and th th they 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 use their gold, what they had, to make a, a golden calf, and, and this calf is actually on the mountainside. I think you must have seen a picture of I've, it. I've seen the picture of it. It's huge. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's cool. Uh, did you ever end up going back to the Middle East? Yeah, a few years later, I spent a week with my wife, and we went to Egypt. Uh, we had a cruise on the Nile, and we went sightseeing in Cairo, uh, especially I wanted to see the Sphinx and the, the pyramids. It seems as though I was ordained to make friends with the archaeology officials of the SCA, that's the Supreme Council of Antiquities in Egypt. I also met uh, a guy by the name of Dr. Zai Hawass, probably a lot of people have heard of oh, him. Oh, yeah. He was, the, he was then the, the Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Antiquities. And I met uh, another guy who named Adele Hussain. And he was the director of the Giza Pyramids. And I got quite friendly with the guy. Uh, he helped me mm -hmm. quite a lot. Uh, actually, I got friendly because I did some healing on him. He had a problem lifting his arm, uh, the outstretched arm no further than his shoulders. And within a couple of minutes, um, I got him to raise it horizontally go to the ceiling. So he was quite impressed, and he thought, if I could do that, and his doctors couldn't do it, uh, I was like Jesus Christ to him. <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> uh, I was allowed to visit. The, he gave me permission to go into the Queen's Chamber after it was closed to tourists with one of his archaeologists. And a strange thing happened there. Uh, to get into the into the chambers of the pyramids, you have to crawl down a like a long corridor. It's only about um, four foot high, so okay. uh, probably less than that, three foot high. And you've got to crawl down it. And a strange thing happens when we got into this queen's chamber. There's two big chambers there: with the king's chamber, the queen's chamber. And what I did was, I closed my eyes, and I placed both of my arms with my hands touching the north wall high up and as I touched it all of a sudden well after a few seconds it seemed as though my body was moving into the wall so I was just stopped I got a bit nervous especially I was in the in the pyramid by myself just with this guide with me so I told the archaeologist to copy what I did and he had the same effect and he wow. said come on we better get out of here we're not saying <laughs> he got nervous too I also got introduced to a, another guy called Monsieur Barak, and he's the com currently the director of the General of Antiquities of Luxor, which is um, a big place where there's a lot of uh, archaeological finds. Mm -hmm. On another occasion, I met, made, made friends with 
uh, Mohammed Ibram Baka. Now, Mohammed Ibram Baka was the former chairman of the Egyptian Antiquities. He was quite a big man, and he's very, very well respected and, and well known throughout all the archaeologists in, in Egypt. And he, at the moment, uh, is a very, very good friend of mine. He, he's helped me quite a lot in, in all what I've been doing. Anyhow, whilst I was in Egypt, I wanted to visit some monasteries. Uh, there's four monasteries where uh, Christian Coptics, you heard of Coptics? Uh, they live in monasteries up in a place called Wadi El Natrun, and that's situated halfway between Cairo and Alexandria, which is in the north. Mm -hmm. And at that time, yeah, the Coptic monks. At that time, because the last the monks I saw were, were the ones, uh, the Greek monks. So these were Coptic monks. The Greek monks were over in the Sinai. At that time, I thought it would be close to the area where I'd, the cave would be, according to the map and what I had on the wall and areas with it which I'd been looking at. However, my driver took me to the wrong monastery. And we landed up in the gates of a monastery called El Baramos. And yet things turned out better there than I even expected. I was introduced to a young monk that spoke perfect English. And he mentioned that the monastery was founded around 330 AD. And its vaults contain many ancient manuscripts of old book. Some, some books, some of them were in Hebrew. And the monk said that he's learning Hebrew so he can read them because it must be interesting to do that. I said, well, better than that, it's better off if you get someone who can translate the books from Israel or some Hebrew guy that does it because it could be interesting and get a more photograph. He says, good idea. Right. But he said that the founder of the monastery, when it was done back in the 300 AD, whatever, uh, he said he was guided there by cherubim. And I looked at him and I says, yep. well, you know, they were mentioned in the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah, cherubs, also yep. known as angels of the second order. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that felt interesting because here I'm looking for something out in the desert, uh, quite a few miles away, well, it's a few miles, maybe 100 miles away from where he was, but out in the desert, and he said he was led there. So that, that seemed quite strange to me. Um, then he led me to a courtyard that had a fountain, and the fountain was made out of petrified wood. Uh, petrified wood is millions of year old wood, uh, which he f they found in the desert. And I says, where did they get the wood from? And he gave us directions to where there was a forest in the desert of petrified wood. And, you know, to find petrified wood, or to buy petrified wood, we're talking of you know, a hundred bucks for a, a piece about six inches long. And here yeah. the guy's telling me that there's a whole desert full of it. Mm. Wow. Uh, cause like, a whole, wood like a whole underground, uh, under sand forest. Yeah, but the, the petrified wood is like wood. It's like metal. It looks like, it, 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 it clings like metal and it's hard as metal. It, it, it's petrified, you know. Okay. Um, so he gave us the directions and eventually we, we came to a makeshift road and either side of the road were these huge logs, petrified logs, logs, with, you know, we're talking about millions of them. And the, the whole desert was full of it. When you walk to the side off, off this beaten road, uh, kick the sand up and you see more of it. It was a whole desert there. It, it was unbelievable. Um, and I thought, well, it's in the direction of the cave, but there's no way we can get out there. Uh, it's a long way to go, and the guy's got his taxi. He couldn't maneuver on, on sand. Right, you need a 4x4. So, four four. Yeah, you, you, you need a 4x2 to do it. Anyway, a year later, I found on the Internet an American that worked in Cairo, and he goes out with a group of people to different coordinates around the world. Well, he was in Egypt, he was doing it in Egypt, and what he does, well, he gets to a, they get to a coordinates, and they put a marker there, and he says, I'm the first guy that's photographed and been out to this coordinates. It's like his, his mark for it. Oh, okay. uh, and he book gives a GPS reading and, uh, and takes a picture of the surrounding area, and he more or less stakes his claim to it. Well, not his claim. It's claim that he was there before anybody else. Right. And when I looked at the, the picture he took of the surrounding area, I saw a pyramid-shaped hill. 
and it looked like what I wanted to find. It looked like the one that was in the drawing that Joyce had done. And a few weeks later, I met an Englishman on the internet that was interested in my research, and he suggested, let's get a go and get a team and go to Egypt and check out the area and see if we can find the cave. I thought, good idea. I wouldn't want to go alone, so it's nice to have a group with me, and um, it wouldn't cost as much. Right. So I said, that's great. So I looked at the map, and I found there was another monastery on the map, not the one where we went, but in another part of Egypt, uh, south, south actually, which seemed to be close to where this guy's coordinates was of this hill. So the, the, we got a team together, five of them actually. One was a Canadian, and the guy who I met on the internet was actually Welsh, and we had a, 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 another guy from Birmingham, and we got a cameraman from Switzerland. And off we went to Cairo. Wow. We, met, we, we met there in a hostel, because none, none of us have got much money, so we went out, we, we could only stay in a hostel. So we said, we'd get our flights, arrange a date, uh, put our money together, and we'll get a couple of four-by-fours and see if we can get out there. Uh, and we got introduced to an English-speaking Egyptian guide who said he can direct us to this monastery. So he said. So we hired two four before us, and we followed the guy's direction, stopping overnight in a small hotel that he knew. Um, we stopped on the way the next day to visit some uh, some old pyramids, um, which which are out there, uh, and we continued the journey. But as we continued, we were stopped by two military trucks, and uh, one of the trucks had an officer on it. And he says, we can't go any further off that course because we have to be escorted. Uh, this is the rule of Egypt now because there was terrorism and all this stuff going on and uh, frightened of anyone being killed. We'd have to have an escort. I said, well, do we, you know, I said to our guy, do we have to pay for this? He says, no, it's, it's a service Egypt provides, which mm. I thought was quite good. So off we had three vehicles in our convoy. We had our two by fours and in front of us, was the um, a military vehicle, and our guide was in that to show him the way, which way we were going. Anyhow, we eventually got to the actual monastery. Um, we were told it wasn't the right one, but uh, the, the monastery uh, monk there spoke good English. In fact, he was, he was uh, educated in America. And he says, we have to, to get to where we got. He looked at the map. He says, where we got to get to, we need to go to another monastery in a place called Wadi Ryan. Okay. And uh, you, he says, you wouldn't be able to cross the desert because it, it's, it will be, it, although it's the shortest route, but it, uh, you might get trapped in a, you know, a drift of sand. And we're talking about desert, desert. In any case, the, um, we had two four before us, but the military escort only had a, just a regular Toyota truck. So they couldn't take us, so we took the long way round to get to this place uh, where this Wadi Ryan is. I said, well, uh, how are we going to find it? He said, well, I'll give you some directions, and he spoke in Arabic to our, our guide. Uh, he says, when you get out there, you're going to pass a a ranger station and then you'll have to go off road into the desert uh, to find this monastery. He says actually it's not a monastery, it's monks living in caves which they've been doing that for quite a few hundred years and yeah. uh, they, they want to keep away from everywhere so they need it nice and quiet so they're out in the desert living in caves uh, and that's their monastery. After staying overnight in the wrong monastery uh, we continued the next day and headed by our military escort. In actual fact, the, the monk at the monastery wrote on, uh, on, a, on a bit of paper um, introducing us to the monk at this uh, Wadi Ryan monastery. So we, we at least had an introduction to them just walk into a monastery in the middle of the desert without knowing who we were. Anyway, it took us about 